Hi, welcome to my channel. I'm Steve Dang. This is my guitar. Uh, we are in the middle of a lesson series looking at D-Natural Blues by Wes Montgomery from uh, the Incredible Jazz Guitar LP. Um, if you've just joined us, um, it's probably a good idea to go back and check out the first lesson, which is the head, and the second lesson, which is uh, us taking a look at the first chorus of Wes's solo. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the second chorus of Wes's solo, uh, which uh, mostly is uh, superimposing stuff, and that's kind of the theme of today's lesson. So we're going to be looking at tritone substitution, uh, superimposing uh, major pentatonic phrases, um, and also superimposing different arpeggios. Um, and some of these um, techniques, um, harmonic, melodic techniques that Wes is using are really useful in our own solos to create that kind of like added spice and kind of sometimes what I call expensive sounds uh, in jazz soloing. Before we do that, thanks so much to my patrons um, who support me in making these videos. It's really, really appreciated. Um, and thanks to all you guys who um, support by subscribing and liking the videos um, and leaving comments below. Um, I really appreciate the support. And it does go a long way to um, encouraging me to make more, um, more videos. Um, if you want to support me um, and you want to do it in a, uh, a short-term basis, um, just on a one-off basis, then you can um, follow the link to buy me a coffee below, which is something that I definitely need um, with uh, my two kids um, keeping me up at night um, and then having to, uh, to record and then lecture online during the week and stuff. Um, so coffee is definitely a must for me. Um, and uh, the link is below for that. Um, and then if you want to um, support me in an, more of an ongoing um, space, then Patreon is the place to go to do that. The link is on the screen and also below uh, in the show notes. Um, and the, uh, the added benefit of doing that is you get some extra lessons. Um, you also get all of the transcriptions for what we're talking about on here, anything that appears on screen. Um, there's also a backing track that is on there. Um, and there's a couple of different tiers. The first tier is just general support. Um, and you get all of the transcriptions and backing tracks for that. And then the second tier is one where you can request a transcription. So if you're struggling to transcribe something and you want to play something, um, then you can request a transcription. Um, uh, Sergey um, requested um, I'll Take Les, um, which is a John Schofield uh, solo. And I've thoroughly enjoyed transcribing that. So um, if anyone else has got anything they want to throw at me to transcribe and send back to them, then that's the second tier. And then the third tier is everything from the first and second tier plus uh, an online lesson with me. Um, so go and take a look at the, uh, the Patreon tiers if that's something that interests you. Um, but if not, then just keep watching and I hope you enjoy. So we're going to jump straight in with the first two bars of the second chorus in Wes's solo. <laughs> first two bars of the second chorus in Wes's solo. Um, this kind of picks up just before um, beat one of the first bar of it. Um, so he plays this arpeggio. Now this arpeggio here, um, you can see this as an A minor nine and then he adds the 11 on top as well. Um, now, this might can kind of confuse you as to why, why is he using that over the top of what is a D7? Um, and what he's doing here is this is a really clever little device um, where it's kind of superimposing different triads um, onto the top of the harmony um, to bring out certain extensions in the chord. So this A minor 9 here with the added 11th on the top, what that essentially is, um, is bringing out the 5th of D the A, then it's bringing out the flat 7, then the 9th, then the 11th, then the 13th, so, and then going up to the tonic at the top. Okay, um, and that's just a really clever way of getting some kind of, you know, spicy sounds. It's not particularly out there, um, it's not outside, it's all diatonic stuff, 
Um, but it's a way of bringing out those extensions. Um, and like I said in the intro, those kind of expensive sounds that kind of are quintessentially kind of Wes and, um, you know, kind of like a 1960s jazz guitar. Um, it's bringing out those sounds. And the way that I see it is either by seeing it as the, the fifth as a minor um, to D7, but it's easier possibly to think of it more as like a C major nine, so like this. Okay, so there's, that's a C major nine arpeggio. And so what it's easy to think about it is if you have your one chord, which is either it could be a major or a dominant seventh, to get all of those extensions in, all you have to do is play a major nine arpeggio, a tone down from where you are. So our chord is D7 and we're playing C major nine, a tone down. So, so that's the first two bars there. So let's look at the next bar. And um, we've got quite a lot going on in each bar here. So let's take a look at bar three. So in this bar, um, Wes has got this really, really cool line. Now there's a lot kind of going on in this and it does remind me when I was kind of taking it apart, I was like, oh, that sounds like Coltrane. Because Coltrane does these really cool little pentatonic fragments, which is like the first four notes of the major pentatonic scale. And he kind of moves them around um, kind of like this. <laughs> Coltrane is doing is taking a C major pentatonic idea over the top of the A minor, shifting it up a semitone to create a bit of outside and then back down again over the top of the five chord, the D7, and then creating an altered five sound with the flat nine added in and the, uh, and the third added in. So he's creating that kind of D7 flat nine arpeggio thing and then and then uh, resolving it back to G. Now that, that kind of, it, what Wes is doing here in this bar in bar three of his second chorus is reminding me of that Coltrane idea. And I wonder whether he's picked that up from, from Coltrane's kind of um, pentatonic stuff that he kind of superimposes over the top of um, his two five ones. <laughs> kind of sounds, it just reminds me of that. And there's a lot of arpeggios in there. So we've got that, which is that, um, that you know, that um, what uh, Wes is doing there, which is that C major pentatonic idea over the top of the D7. So like I said in the last thing, it's that um, major idea, a tone down from where you are, which brings out all of these extensions. And so he's probably doing that. And then, you know, following it further up, so kind of creating like an E minor arpeggio. So you can see that in there, which is like this. And then he, as he comes down, he's, he's kind of going. So we've got a bit of enclosure. And he's using that kind of outside note there to enclose the A. And then he comes down an A minor arpeggio. Um, which um, really, if you kind of view it from D, um, that's more of a D9 sound. So it brings out that D9 kind of sound there. So all of these arpeggios, it's, it's useful to think, um, it, I know it's confusing sometimes, but it's useful to think in ways like, okay, if I want extensions um, from the chord, all I have to do is think of a major nine, uh, a, a, a tone down and play that over the top of the chord. So a C major nine over a D seven, or I can think of the, uh, the A minor um, arpeggio, the A minor seven arpeggio um, uh, over the top of the D seven to create um, a D nine kind of sound. So it kind of, those arpeggios, if you're familiar with that, it's kind of like shortcuts. And I find that really useful. And I know that a lot of jazz musicians work in that way. They superimpose arpeggios or triadic pairs over the top of chords to bring out certain sounds. And rather than thinking in sharp five, sharp nine, 
flat uh, flat nine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it, it's kind of it's easier to think in terms of oh, I'll just play this arpeggio, and that brings out all of these diatonic extensions, or that brings out all of these altered extensions. So what we're saying here is that if you want to bring out all of the diatonic extensions, play a major nine, a tone down from where you are, and if you want to bring out all of the uh, D9 kind of sounds, then just play um, a minor arpeggio um, built on the fifth. So in this case, on the A. So let's take a look at bar four. So bar four, bar four, we've got some tritone substitution. Now, what is tritone substitution? Um, well, this isn't really a lesson to go uh, deep into tritone substitution, but essentially a tritone is a note that is three notes away from where you are. So in this case, a tritone away from D is A flat. Um, and what um, Wes is bringing out over the top of this two, five, one into the, the four chord. So we've got A minus seven into D seven going to G. Um, what he's bringing out is the tritone A flat seven, and he's kind of superimposing that idea over the top of it where it, it doesn't exist in the harmony. So there's no one playing an A flat seven underneath. He's superimposing it over the top. And this is where you get those really nice outside sounds, those clashy sounds that resolve so satisfyingly. A tritone is a, t a note that is three tones away, so A flat. And then what we do is we build a dominant seventh chord on that, so A flat seven. Okay, and what you get there is this kind of sound. So instead of getting A minor seven to D seven to G seven, which is what is in the harmony, you get this sound which is A flat seven, then going to G seven. I'm really sorry if you're hearing really odd noises. Um, that is my sleeping Dach hand, which is next to me, that is snoring all the way through this. Clearly, she is very enthused by uh, all of this chat about jazz. So the interesting thing about building that dominant seventh um, chord on the tritone, the A flat, um, is the fact that it shares notes with the the D seven. So A flat seven built out of the notes of A flat. G flat, C, and E flat. Now, if we analyze that from a D7 point of view, what we've got is the major third of D7, okay? In D7, we'd call it F sharp, so not, not G flat, but it's the same note. And then we've got the C, which is the flat seven, and then we've also got the E flat, which is the flat nine. So we get this D7 flat nine kind of sound. Um, and with the A flat, the tritone, we get even more of that kind of outness because that A flat is the, the flat five um, or sharp 11 of, of D. So we've got tons and tons of, uh, of really kind of crunchy tension um, that then resolves to the G. And as I said, it's not in the harmony. So Tommy Flanagan um, is not playing it in the harmony, but Wes is, is superimposing it using his line here. So that scale that he's kind of playing there is notes from the A-flat Lydian dominant, which is this. And the Lydian dominant brings out all of the notes from the, the tritone substitution. So. Um, as I said, it's not a perfect substitution because he's not substituting the harmony, but he's suggesting it in his melody. Um, and this is something we can do. So whenever you see um, the D7 going towards the G7, so acting as a functioning dominant chord, you can, in your harmony, even if the piano player or second guitarist isn't playing it, you can play an A flat seven over the top of it. Or if you're in a different key, just go a tritone away find the dominant seventh chord on that, and then either play the arpeggio, or you can play a Lydian dominant um, scale based on that, that note. Okay, so bars five to six, let's take a look. Yeah, this line here, when I first learned this, it gave me a lot of trouble kind of navigating that. 
It's really fiddly with the fingering, so I'm kind of doing this. And what he's playing here, this is, um, it's over a G7 chord, um, and he's playing um, G7 Lydian dominant over the top of it. And that's that really kind of tense, tritone-ish sound that we were talking about earlier. That sound. Um, the scale is this. And then what he does is he resolves that line. So that Lydian dominant that arpeggio of that um, 9 sharp 11 sound, that G9 sharp 11 sound. Going down. So he's then resolving it to this really lovely sequence. Um, which is, um, he's kind of seeing it as um, the, the G mixolydian probably, um, and then going down the um, down the, the D minor pentatonic scale there, um, which is really cool. It's a really lovely kind of resolution after that really tense Lydian dominant sound. And he's got this really cool laid back feel that I really tried to kind of get, but I don't think I got it perfectly. I think I need to work on it, but he's got this really cool kind of like laid back off of the beat um, thing. almost kind of rushes that that run back down the scale which is cool um so you know something we can learn from this is that you know with that that chord there those those two um bars where we've got g7 where we've got the four chord um we can superimpose the lydian dominant over the top of it even though it's not supported in the harmony you can superimpose that g Lydian dominant sound over the top of it to create some tension and then resolve it back to either G mix Lydian um, or just back to the D minor pentatonic and Wes does both here. So let's look at uh, the last uh, section which is bars 7 to 12. <laughs> So the really cool thing here, um, I think that I picked up off of this was um, Wes's use of one arpeggio. Um, and he was basically stretching it out over all of those bars. And as we kind of saw in the Kenny series, we talked a lot about repetition um, and um, stretching your idea out, getting the most out of your idea, being economical, as I call it, with your ideas. Um, because otherwise you just run out of ideas. So what Wes is doing here is he's got E minus seven arpeggio that he's got, so. Um, so let's just take a look at that close up. So he's got this really cool kind of like laid back feel as he comes back off of that. And then bringing out the notes of that um, F sharp minor seven. Sliding into the major third. To the flat third. scale down the end there and what he's really bringing out as he runs down that is that the whole idea is based around this E minor 7 arpeggio and that E minor 7 arpeggio brings out um, that kind of D13 kind of sound with the 9th and then the 11th and then the 13th and then the, uh, the tonic itself so you've got this really again bringing out extensions just like we did with the C major 9 thing uh, a tone down um, from the actual chord that you're on, um, the E minor seven. So uh, an arpeggio that is uh, tone up will also bring out those um, those tones as well, the ninth, the 11th, and the 13th, um, which is E, G, and B respectively um, in the key of D. Um, so again, it's another kind of superimposition of an idea over the top of something to create some spice and some nice, um, you know, expensive sounds, as I said. So I think that's something that we can get into our solos. Um, don't rush to get to the next idea, really mull it over and try and develop it. We talked about this whole idea that, you know, this is something that classical composers do. They, they take one idea and modulate it into different keys and move it back and retrograde and um, reverse and all that kind of stuff, just to kind of make the most out of an idea and be really economical with it. Let's take a look at the takeaways. 
So I think the uh, you know the whole overarching idea of this is superimposing different things over the top of stuff to suggest things that aren't actually supported in the harmony, so as to create tension or to bring out certain sounds, certain extensions that are kind of hidden within the tonality of the key. Um, so the first thing, number one, is to take a look at the superimposing of arpeggios. Um, so that would be in our case, the C major nine arpeggio, which is the uh, major nine arpeggio toned down from where you are. And that brings out all of those lovely extensions, the nine, the 11 and the 13, and also the flat seven. Um, and um, we also just saw at the end there as well, where you can go a tone up and do a minor arpeggio, and that brings out the, the tonic note, um, and then also the nine, 11 and 13 as well. Um, and we also saw that the, the, the arpeggio, the minor arpeggio built off of the fifth, that also brings out a, a dominant nine kind of sound as well um, in the chord that you're in. Number two is those Coltrane pentatonic ideas. So using the first four notes of the, uh, the, uh, of the uh, major pentatonic arpeggio. So in our case, we did that a, again, a tone down from where we were. So we were over the top of D and we did a C major pentatonic idea. Um, and we had that lovely Coltrane lick that we learned, which is lovely to put over um, a 251. The third thing to take away is the tritone substitution. Um, I think I might do a, a whole lesson on what tritone substitution is because I kind of really briefly covered it here. Um, and I don't think I went into too much depth about it. Um, but um, yeah, tritone substitution, um, where you substitute the, uh, the, the the acting fifth chord, the acting dominant chord. Um, so in the case we were moving towards G, um, the dominant chord, which is acting as the fifth, was the D7. And we substituted that with a dominant seventh, a tritone away, um, which brought out some extensions and some altered stuff from within uh, the, 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 D, the dominant chord. Um, so uh, yeah, use that um, and suggest it in your soloing, even though it's not supported in the harmony. Uh, and to go along with that as well, kind of adding into that is the Lydian dominant idea. Subs uh, and that's kind of, you know, part and parcel of that, that tritoned thing, the Lydian dominant scale. Uh, and we saw that um, it, uh, put over the top of the, the four chord um, over the G7, he played G Lydian dominant over the top of it. Um, so yeah, try that in your solos as well. And then the final thing um, is uh, being really economical with your ideas and developing your ideas. I think that you know we can um, rush too much to get onto the next idea for fear maybe that the idea that we came up with wasn't good enough, but I think you need to explore it before you decide whether it's good enough or not. Thanks so much for watching this far, if you got this far. Um, and thanks again to my patrons who make this possible. Um, don't forget to subscribe. Um, thank you so much to everyone who watches these videos and supports me in making them. Um, not only helps with lockdown blues and things like that, um, but um, is also just something that I feel really passionate about um, to make sure that the ideas, these theoretical ideas, we're actually using them in context rather than just being theoretical entities that never get used and just stay up here rather than getting out onto here. Um, so yeah, thanks so much to everyone who subscribes, comments, likes, um, I really appreciate it. Um, if you want to join the Patreon, then the link is here again and in the show notes. And if you want to support me in a one-off fashion, then uh, buy me a coffee, the link is below. Um, and I really appreciate that because I love coffee. Um, so thanks so much for watching and happy practicing. I will see you next week. Bye.